Practical Engineering is brought to you in part by Audible, and by viewers like you through Patreon. We all know that magnets are pretty much voodoo, invisible forces acting on the real world in unknown and unexpected ways, but engineers have developed a number of methods to harness that magic to perform useful and beneficial tasks, including answer that age-old question, how do you measure the flow of liquid in a pipe? Hey, I'm Grady. Today on Practical Engineering, we're building a magnetic flow meter. From metering the dose of a medicine in an IV, to measuring the flow of irrigation water on a farm, to tracking your fuel fill-up, flow meters play a role in nearly every area of our lives. In fact, there's probably a meter outside your home counting your water usage for your monthly utility bill. There are a whole host of ways we can measure flow, but today I want to talk about a method I think is particularly fascinating, the magnetic flow meter. We'll walk through some of the electrical engineering behind this ingenious device and try to overcome the challenges that arise when the real world doesn't quite match the theory. But the theory comes first, so we'll start at the beginning. A magnetic flow meter relies on Faraday's law of induction, which basically says this. Moving a conductor through a magnetic field will generate an electromotive force, which is proportional to the velocity. Let's break that down just a bit with an example. I've got a magnet and a conductor, in this case a coil of wire. The conductor is connected to a new toy in the shop, an oscilloscope, which is an instrument for measuring changing voltage and displaying it on a screen. For example, here's a typical AC sine wave similar to what you measure at a wall outlet. If I keep the conductor still within the magnetic field, nothing happens. But as soon as I move the magnet, we see a spike in voltage. This is the electromotive force, or EMF, in Faraday's law. The faster the coil passes through the magnetic field, the higher the voltage spikes, demonstrating that the EMF is proportional to the velocity. A magnetic flow meter works exactly the same way, except instead of wire, the conductor is a fluid in a pipe. Magnets outside the pipe create a magnetic field. Electrodes are located perpendicular to the magnets. A conductive fluid moving through the pipe will generate a voltage between the electrodes due to Faraday's law. The faster the fluid moves through the pipe, the higher the voltage. Once you know the velocity of the fluid, you can calculate flow using the cross-sectional area of the pipe. It seems pretty straightforward, but let's see if it really works. Here's the test setup. I've got a length of PVC pipe with a pump on one side. I can control the flow of water using this valve. Two stainless steel bolts serve as electrodes to measure the EMF. And to create the magnetic field, I'm starting with two permanent neodymium magnets. I'm measuring the EMF using a differential amplifier to boost the signal into my oscilloscope. Watch what happens when I start to let the water flow through the pipe. The voltage jumps. We're definitely getting an electrical response to the flowing water, but you can see that we have a fairly noisy signal. It would be a major challenge to try and convert this signal into a flow reading. The problem is electrical noise, and there are a few potential sources of noise here. First, depending on the fluid chemistry and the type of metal used for the electrodes, an electrolytic reaction between the liquid and the electrode can generate an electric potential. Second, stray voltages can sometimes exist within the fluid from other equipment along the pipe, like the pump. Finally, the liquid in the meter can have some capacitance. To a very limited extent, it can actually charge up like a battery, which can create noise in the voltage signal between the electrodes. The problem is, there's no way to know what part of the signal is due to the flow and what part is just noise. And the noise can be significantly bigger than the part of the signal we actually care about. In electrical engineering, we would say that the signal-to-noise ratio is high. In other words, the theory behind the magnetic flow meter is sound, but the real world is getting in the way of things. This is where the physicists throw up their hands and the electrical engineers step in. And the electrical engineers have found that one way to avoid the issues mentioned above is to change the magnetic field over time. Here's how it works. 
This is a graph of a magnetic field which varies in strength as a series of biphasic DC pulses. Biphasic because it has negative and positive pulses, and DC because unlike a typical AC sine wave which is constantly changing, the waveform only has two values, on or off. Above is an example of the resulting EMF from a magnetic flow meter. Remember, we only care about the portion of the EMF generated by the magnetic field, since this is the only part of the signal which is proportional to the velocity of the fluid. Everything else is just noise. Notice that even when there is no magnetic field, there may still be a non-zero voltage between the electrodes. But if we sample the signal at the peak of the magnetic field, and subtract the voltage measured when the magnetic field is zero, we're left with only the part of the signal we care about. Even if the noise is changing over time, we're only measuring the part of the signal which is induced by the magnetic field. Obviously, there's no easy way to generate this type of waveform with permanent magnets, so we'll have to switch to electromagnets. Of course I'm using artisan electromagnet coils, hand wound in small batches with locally sourced magnet wire. Here's a diagram of the overall setup. The electromagnets on the flow meter are powered using an H-bridge. This is a circuit that allows a small signal to control high current devices like electromagnets. The control signal in this case is provided by an Arduino. I've written some simple code so I can control the frequency and duty cycle of the biphasic DC pulses. There's a GitHub link in the description if you're interested in the code. The blue line shown here is the voltage waveform going to the electromagnets. Unfortunately, even with all the trouble, this setup wasn't quite strong enough to give me a reliable signal. From some literature I read, a well setup meter typically only generates about 100 microvolts for every foot per second of velocity, or about 300 microvolts for a meter per second. For my garage workshop and the pump I'm using, that's a needle in a haystack of RF noise and hum, especially considering that my crude apparatus can hardly be considered well set up. Every once in a while, if I was standing at just the right spot in the room, I could get a clean response from the electrodes, but I just wasn't ever able to catch it with a camera. But this video is all about the devil in the details, so I guess I should have expected this to be a bigger challenge. For now, let me just use some example data to demonstrate how a real meter would calculate flow. Let's say I was able to measure the induced voltage in the electrodes for a number of different flow rates in the pipe. I could plot those points on a graph. Since the EMF is linearly proportional to velocity, and velocity is linearly proportional to the volumetric flow rate, these points should fall in roughly a straight line. The slope of this line can be used as a proportionality constant in the signal processing of the flow meter. And the math becomes dead simple. Step 1, measure the induced voltage. Step 2, multiply the voltage by the calibration constant. Voila, you just measured the flow. It really is that simple, assuming you get a good signal from your electrodes. From generators at a power plant to the pickups on an electric guitar, Faraday's law of induction is working behind the scenes in some of the most unlikely places, including an ingenious method of measuring the flow of liquid through a pipe. I am a bit disappointed I couldn't get the prototype working better, but I think there were some good lessons that came out of it regardless, namely that electrical engineering is hard. I thought about not making a video at all, but I think documenting your failure is just as important as documenting success. And this is hardly the most shameful thing I've put on the internet. After some feedback on the EEV blog forums and some additional reading, I think fixing the demo would require a full redesign. And I figured you guys would rather me move on to something new rather than keep spinning my wheels on this one. If you have any ideas or suggestions, I'd love to hear them in the comments. And if you're interested in more technical details that I didn't have time to include in the video, I'll have those posted to my website in the next few weeks. Thank you for watching, and let me know what you think. I hope you enjoyed the episode, which was sponsored in part by Audible. I've been using Audible for a long time now, so I'm very excited to have them supporting the channel. You guys know I like to learn new things, sometimes it's hard to make time to read, but I've got a long commute to my day job, so I choose to spend that time listening to books. Audible's got over 250,000 titles, so I know I'm never going to have a hard time finding something new. I usually switch off between fiction and nonfiction. Right now I'm listening to American Gods by Neil Gaiman. It's an awesome story about modern mythology, and this is a full cast audiobook with different voice actors for each character. If you want to try it out, Audible's offering a free 30-day trial membership through Practical Engineering. 
You can pick any book of your choice for free, and it's yours to keep whether you continue your membership or not. To sign up, go to audible.com/engineer. Again, thank you for watching.